Welcome back to Self Love Ignited. Today, I had the honor and privilege of interviewing Emma Pleasure. Best name, best name. Emma is your pleasure coach. She supports women to experience intuitive, mindful, and embodied pleasure in life and bed. Working with Emma is an invitation to a deep unlearning and then relearning a new, more intuitive way of being full of, in of integrity to self. Her work relies on a strong foundation of nervous system regulation from which the capacity and mindset for pleasure can be developed. Emma came on to share her story of how she got to this place of pleasure. She has a self-love journey that many people will identify with. Um, and it took her many, many years to get to this place where she is now fully embodied in this place of love, unconditional love for self and for others. Um, and she does this in her work as well. Her story is incredible. If you have any um, guilt or shame or, or shame or hangups around sex, sexuality, pleasure, um, asking for what you want, embodiment, um, self-worth. If you have anything like that, I can pretty much promise you that this conversation is going to be helpful and healing and beautiful. So jump on in, meet Emma, listen up. She has some great wisdom for you. My name is Katie Allen, and this is Self Love Ignited. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Self Love Ignited. Today on the podcast, I am interviewing Emma Pleasure. By the way, best name ever, Emma. I love that. Welcome to the podcast. Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to everybody? Hello, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited, especially after our previous chat. Uh, I, I don't know, I never know what to say, not because I don't like talking about myself, but because there's so many different aspects of self. I guess in the context of what we're here to share, it's probably important that I'm Emma Pleasure because my work is in the realm of pleasure, both in life and bed. But, you know, all those other hats include like being a mom and I have one child at home and one child at school and lots of different aspects of life that fill me on a daily basis like right now I I'm ready to go for a run but it's pouring so I quickly changed the top half of me but I'm still like <laughs> you know half, half run ready you know so I feel like who I am is is this state that is kind of moving constantly through time based on what life is in presenting to me whilst, whilst I also hold these high values of integrity and connection and mindfulness. And it could be anything. I mean, it could be cooking or looking after chickens or going for a bushwalk <laughs> or watching a burlesque show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like we said, like before I hit record, like we said, like you have one child at home today, one child at school today there might be a kid who comes and joins us and we're going to talk about pleasure in all of its forms in your story. And like, you can be all of those aspects of you at the same time. We, we don't need to compartmentalize completely. Right. It's like, it's about integrating all of that and it's absolutely in its beautiful, messy, chaotic perfection. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have a really great example of that when I was doing a live about libido and I don't put my children on the internet but my seven-year-old was next to me just out of the frame and was asking me to help her sew and knit and so I was like threading needles <laughs> at the same time <laughs> as I was talking about I wasn't talking about anything explicit at all that wouldn't have been age appropriate but there were so many comments on I love how you can just talk about this while you're also helping you know, this little person with their sewing and their project and and like it was you know for other people that was amazing and for me that's just life <laughs> yeah 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 so let's talk about how that became life because this was yeah. not always life for you um so Emma I would love to hear your unique story of self-love whatever that means to you you know this journey of not liking not loving not honoring who you are to being the woman that you are today so bring us back to the beginning where did your challenges with yourself 
start? What did that look like? Yeah, I was thinking, when did this start? And my awareness of it is my early 20s and probably highlighted by my next door neighbour at the time. And he very gently, kindly, calmly suggested that I go and see someone to talk about my life. And I did. And I followed his recommendation and that turned out to be excellent And what I didn't know at the time was that the anxiety and the, like the parts of me that was so hard on myself, and I I have this thing called unrelenting standards, but I also have a schema where I wasn't good enough. So I had these massive standards that I could never reach. And so my life was this series of, you know, well, I didn't get, a high distinction in university or my body never looked how I wanted it to be or I said the wrong thing to someone and there, there was just so many elements where I constantly fell down on standards and it took me a long time to realize that those standards weren't mine you know this was a conditioned understanding of who I should be and how I should be in the world and that I was constantly measuring myself up against something that was inherently setting myself up to fail and unpacking that has been decades <laughs> <laughs> decades of life but but you know really started like I remember pivotal moments in my early journey with my therapist where you know I'd I'd detail you know, some life event that I that I had had and and I remember one in particular was about sitting a uni exam that my doctor had said I was my I was just not in a state to sit that exam and I went anyway and my therapist was Emma do you think this was self-abuse it's like no what do you mean what what do you mean like what is self-abuse and he was just kind of well there's this and then there's this and then there's this and then there's this and then there's this that sounds like self-abuse to me and that was a really big eye-opener on this journey of you know, how we think about things is not necessarily healthy, even if it's normal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. There's so many things in society that are normalized that we just accept as the way things are or the way everybody is. That doesn't mean it's right for you. And that doesn't mean that it's healthy in any way. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you found yourself there at uni in your early twenties, going to therapy, having these like aha moments of realizing what you were doing and how you were showing up and that it was not healthy and not sort of honoring who, who you are. How did you sort of dig, how did you dig deeper and how did that lead you to pleasure ultimately? Yeah. And pleasure came mm, like 15 years after Mm. this still quite away into the journey I think a lot of it is a series of pivotal moments you know those those moments that you never forget that you know I remember just like being in hysterics over I ate two Tim Tams you know the second Tim Tam just broke all the rules and the therapist saying Emma people eat the whole pack and me being what do you mean the whole pack in one sitting and I couldn't comprehend how you could work through that much anxiety that you could keep doing that from one biscuit to the next biscuit (laughs) (laughs) and eventually realized that these people that can eat a whole pack of Tim Tams in one sitting, one, they don't feel sick from it, presumably, but also they didn't have that level of anxiety. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So they didn't have all these rules and reasons why they were stopping. So things like that were really liberating and and there are little, little moments along the way with food like the time when I was pregnant that I realized I just you know closed up the package and put it away like I didn't just keep eating like there was a limit there that I now knew how to found how to find and so like learning how to not swing off the pantry door and use food as an emotional workhorse has been part of this journey and that came from really being able to be present with my emotions you know, so there, there was, you know, I would feel something and I didn't know I was feeling something and and then I would eat and then I would 
feel shame because I was eating. So unraveling all of that was big in itself. But then learning to feel was such a huge part of this experience because then I could stay present to what was happening. Yeah, and and that that's mass. It's inter- I can see myself in your story as well, right? Using food to cope with stress, to numb emotions that I didn't want to be feeling. Like I think so many of us have our own version of that. Um, but what you said, you know, learning to feel the feelings. Yeah. and not run away from them and not numb them like that is so scary for so many people right like that is like a huge mountain to climb huge. yeah yeah particularly in a cultural conditioning where we're told that emotions are not okay mm. you know and we're too much you know if we're emotional whether it be angry or whether we're in a moment of anxiety or a moment of distress that we're too much and so then we learn to people please and shove the emotions down so that we can keep the status quo in our relationships or you know keep our the positive way that people are looking at us or so that we don't make other people uncomfortable and so in learning to feel and learning to honor that we also need to unpack all of those aspects and reprogram well actually it's safe and So I did that by also sharing those parts of me with people that I knew were safe people, Mm -hmm. people that could hold that. And I still do that today. There's still not because I need it to feel safe, but because there is a level of there is a level of being held that becomes how you want to be seen. And I love it when someone can simply be present for me rather than try to put a positive wash on it. Oh, it'll be all right. You'll be fine. You know, it's, it's, that's not the level that, you know, once you can hold things, there's something about that, that is not in, that is disconcordant. That's not in concordance with the experience that you're having. It, it kind of creates some kind of disconnect. Yes. Yeah. So I think that that aspect, just appreciating you know, the relationships that we have that can hold us as we move and grow is also important in our self-love journey because the like we're evolving, people evolve with us, the level of support that we seek and the types of support that we seek also change on that journey. And all of that becomes part of the picture of continuing our momentum towards a life that is full of integrity. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you, that you can see that, like you clearly been on this journey for a long time and you have a lot of self-awareness around this, but you know, it's inevitable when our relationship with self changes, it, it changes who we are, which is going to change our other relationships. And like, I think just by default, I think it's unavoidable. It's, it's just sort of a natural process. Um, and for some people that can be kind of scary. If there's someone listening who is maybe afraid of what this may do to other relationships in their life, do you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is this is one that is it's it's this area that we kind of dance in that feels so freaking fraught in the moment because you're looking at a relationship that isn't serving you, and all of the conditioning says. Uh, you know, well, you've got to keep this person around because you've got a history and maybe you want the relationship to shift and grow, but there's also these aspects where we can't just ask someone to change. And so how do we navigate this? And I think allowing ourselves to, uh, we don't have to have all the answers right now, like allowing ourselves to sit in the uncertainty mm-hmm. and allowing ourselves to have time to grieve a relationship that was that isn't as it is right now is also really important and maybe to grieve just the idea that it might not be what we want it to be or it might not actually have been what we ever even thought it was is actually a really big part whether we then let go of relationships or whether it does continue to move with us is you know not so much that process where we're grieving and we're in it we're just trying to find acceptance of what is happening, what is true for us now. And then sometimes things just evolve naturally from there. You know, there might be a big moment or you might find yourself start 
moving into relationships with other people where you're experiencing something different and that kind of you know sets a light bulb moment off or that person moves a different way or moves towards you you just never know what magic happens when you just sit with the self in that moment yeah yeah beautifully said beautifully said yeah and and you know sitting sitting with the self I think is one of once you get over the initial questions if you don't know what it's going to be like it's actually one of the most beautiful peaceful places to be when you've done the work right at the beginning it can feel scary because it's unknown and everything unknown to us is scary as human beings it's like our nature um but once you go within oh that's beautiful that's beautiful okay (laughs) let's keep let's keep going through your story I want I want to get to where you uh, let's let's get to the good stuff yeah. <laughs> um okay so you're at uni you're self-abusing you're in your 20s what happened after that what what other what other work you know brings through the next 15 years <laughs> yeah. I just want to acknowledge that I just had a moment with the self-abusing I was like whoa uh, did I do that 100 percent, I did that yeah <laughs> Yeah, 100%. And there's still ways, right? I might have a late night and recognize this is not, you know, there's a fine line between what you categorize as self abuse and what's just not self caring. But when we are deliberately not looking after self, and it could be sabotage, I mean, sometimes it's just helpful (laughs) to really call a spade a spade. (laughs) because it's confronting right so there's so many there's so many aspects along this journey where I've looked at myself and gone whoa I'm really uncomfortable with that and have made shifts and everything builds and this is what I think also in in parts of these journeys you know we revisit things and we think hang on why am I here I thought I was so much better than this or why am I dealing with this issue again and I think a lot of that is We revisit things at a new level of awareness or a new level of capacity to be able to hold the self. And so in that 15 years, I did that, I don't know, 15 million times (laughs) (laughs) over different things. And parenting brought on a whole other set of things. Just before I was parenting, I was managing a youth center in, um, in the city where I lived at the time and like managing staff, managing young people with trauma that was supporting young people with trauma, like that in itself was a huge catalyst in the journey because I was far enough out of my own dysfunction and not yet in the other camp, but I was supporting people who were very much still in their dysfunction And so that actually was really big in my journey towards loving myself because I could see the trajectory from both ends. And in 2018, I, you know, what some people call the dark night of the soul. I mean, I had one of these that I remember coming out and my husband saying our whole family has lost six months of our lives. Um, It was just intense. And I remember like, dropping my children to my friend's house in my pajamas and just coming home and going back to bed. And, and I don't really remember that period of time. Mm. And what I was working through in that period was the deepest depths of the shame around my biggest trauma. And I could not be where I am today without those moments curled in the fetal position, sobbing for hours and without learning to reprogram the thoughts where, you know, I would be engaged in a self-loving action and then something like a a, a, a harmful to self desire would come. And I'm, and I'm not talking about actually self-harming, but just, you know, being engaged in a mental soothing activity like um, in a in like under a waterfall or in a beautiful shower or something and then it was it was like I would have these visions where the water would get too hot and I'd want to scratch my skin and it was all mental but it was all reflective of the self-hatred that I was still holding yeah and so this was like I was working with three different practitioners (laughs) and um I came out of that and that's when I found pleasure 
So I bought two books. One was called Pussy A Reclamation by Regina Thomas Howler. And the other one was Gabby Bernstein's new book, The Universe Has Your Back. And that one arrived first. And I remember being devastated. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Pussy arrived, I was, I just read that book cover to cover. It took me seven days. I had two really young kids in the house. And that was this massive light bulb moment of this is the missing link in my work. I'm here to bring pleasure, this concept of pleasure to women, and also recognising things like I felt shame for enjoying sex in a relationship that I'd been in for 10 years. You know, consensual, loving, pleasurable, very vanilla sex. It's not like there was anything, not that sex ever has anything really consensual sex is beautiful and there just was no, it was all conditioning. And so I started to give myself permission to enjoy that more. And that's where pleasure and self-love really shifted was like owning that I have power within my being, that I have power as a woman, that I have power as a sexual entity was where I really started to come alive. And I noticed that as my relationship in the bedroom changed. And I mean, how does something good become even better, right? (laughs) I was not a woman that complained about my sex life, but I didn't know that I wasn't making love. And I didn't know that even though there was a connection and a presence and, and like, you know, many orgasms, I didn't know that if the intimacy became the more important thing or the meeting of each other became the more important thing, that sex could be a whole something else, just like a mind-blowing thing. And so we, I, I now notice, like, you know, we're kind of four years on from there, I now notice that we still do this dance of, like, we can work it's not not work things out in our relationship but if we we can use what happens in the bedroom to bring our relationship to a new level there's some transcendence that happens and now that mostly happens through tantra through just that that deeper intention with each other and finding the small moments through the day to keep a relationship burning and who I am as a result of that <laughs> like it it almost sounds silly doesn't it just to say sex changed my life <laughs> uh, but it was a really important piece of the puzzle a, yeah. a really important piece because there was so much about the trauma that I that I was holding that didn't allow me to go there and when I could go there to where I could never go yeah I can go everywhere Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just having a moment. I'm just like processing everything you've said. But, you know, the thing that comes to mind first and foremost is like powerful, powerful. That is like the main energy that I'm getting from you, from, from this, from this piece of your beautiful puzzle, your tapestry of life is power. And there's just so much shame and guilt and stuff that like society, right? It's conditioning and we are all exposed to it in our own way. And I think most people are probably not even conscious of it, not even aware that it's there under the surface, but listening to you speak I'm just like, wow, I can see that in myself and I can see this in a friend in that conversation and I can see this challenge with this person. And, you know, like that is a, that is a massive thing. But the fact that you can now say like sex changed your life. Yeah. And it like, it changed who you are and your relationship and everything. Yeah. That's incredible. That is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the beginning? So I know you said that you read the book. What was it called again? Pussy something? Pussy, a reclamation. Pussy, a reclamation. Okay. So I'm going to read that book. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, That is going on my reading list. (laughs) It's a great book. Look, it's really full on. If you're still very entrenched in your, in your conditioning, it can be a very, very full on book. Yeah. So 
I mean, just for any readers, if you're finding that experience, then maybe like read from the perspective of what could I take from this, even if what I'm reading is just so challenging and I'm not ready. Is there one grain of salt per chapter, one takeaway that I can integrate? And then next time you go back, you might be able to revisit and, you know, go in a little bit further. Yeah. 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 Yeah, That's great advice. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. So where you are now, you say a lot of this work is now coming from Tantra and you connecting with your partner. So I have two questions. Number one, how did you discover Tantra? Where was the introduction of that? And number two, how did you introduce this to your relationship? Yeah, good questions. Um, I feel like there's a step in here that I've missed as well because I feel it's really important to say sex doesn't just start in the bedroom. Like Mm -hmm. this is a connection that happens in life or a way of being that we hold ourselves, and that's the piece of pleasure as well, how we like allow ourselves to have things in life that feel really good and have these moments where we slow down. So I think of pleasure as being mindful, intentional and possibly even devotional. Like it can be a spiritual practice because to actually derive pleasure, we need to be present. And I love to use the example of a block of chocolate. You know, we can eat an entire block of chocolate and there can be no pleasure in that, even if it's delicious. And we can save a one square and it can be the most exquisite thing we've ever eaten. That's what pleasure is, right? So translate pleasure through your life and it's the earrings that you choose or the way you hold yourself when you go for a walk or what we're, what we're choosing to wear or where we choose to eat our lunch. And so all these pieces are really important in creating a whole that you share with other people that then leads to something like being able to accept the introduction of something like Tantra. And so Tantra is probably not what most people think it to be. We, in, <laughs> in the developed world, we tend to think of it as being all about sex, something a little bit like the Kama Sutra. And Tantra is a philosophy more like yoga. It's a philosophy of love and connection. And it's really about knowing thyself and then know thy partner or know the others. So we always learn to be with the self. And then from that place of self-knowing, we share ourselves with other people. So that means things like I can hold this part of me that's reacting while I have this conversation, right? So we, I, a tantra, I think was just a bit like the book. It was just popping up, popping up here and there. And so I did a bit of reading and I followed this person and I did a couple of um, workshops and then for self-exploration, I did a certification and then I've just finished my practitioner level training a couple of months ago. And I introduced it to the relationship just by, just by acknowledging things like it feels really dissatisfying that when we greet and part, we're just doing this like little perfunctionary kiss, kiss on the kiss, you know, and I would like something more present. And so we tend to do foreheads together. So just like pressing foreheads, I'm touching my forehead and my nose for all those people who are listening. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we, this also is significant because my husband's from New Zealand. So this is also called a Maori kiss where they press their foreheads together. And and part of what you're doing is being in this space where I see you. And my tantra teacher likes to say intimacy into me, I see. Mm. And uh, so there was just little moments that were brought in rather than this big overarching concept. And then, you know, we did things like synchronize the breath in the bedroom. And that was just a whole other level of like pleasure and presence and, So from him having an experience of, well, that one little technique changed so much and and this one idea and way of being changed so much, he's gone and done a few things for himself and um, he participates not as a teacher but as my helper when I run tantra things and he's, you know, quite quite happy to do that and then we'll sometimes talk about his experience of, of what that is. So it's become just from really small things become um, something that we're both interested in continuing because there was a real 
understanding of this has a positive impact on my life and my relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's gorgeous. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's beautiful how the two of you, you know, as humans, we're always, we're always growing and evolving and changing. And the fact that your husband was, you know, saw the change in that one little thing and, and is now growing and changing with you. And this is something that, you know, you can do together. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Emma, this journey that you have been on and are on because it never ends. We're, we're still alive. We're always changing. (laughs) Um, Does this feel like a journey of self love to you? Is it like self exploration, self acceptance? What feels true to you? I think it's all those things, but definitely self-love really resonates. And I, and I think when I think about the overall picture, if I think from a spiritual perspective of, you know, if there was a thing that I came to this life to learn, what would that be? And I actually think that that's love. Like I really, I didn't know what love was. Love was very conditional. And so my self-love was very conditional. Mm. And learning to know what unconditional love is uh, that's a mind f in itself (laughs) you know if we're steeped in our conditioning I don't think we can even really appreciate that something like that actually exists yeah you know there's no there's no performance there's no standards there's no pleasing me that you have to do for me to love you I love you even when you're angry because you're angry because you show your anger to me even if your anger is bringing up something in me that's uncomfortable, I still love you. And, you know, I I make mistakes and I say, I'm sorry, I didn't handle that well. And I think that's part of a self-love journey too, is the humility and how we hold ourselves through that. And I, I definitely think for me that the language of self-love encompasses self-acceptance, encompasses the exploration because I couldn't have learned to love myself if I couldn't allow myself to explore some other reality that wasn't mine another perspective like everybody's complimenting me but when I look in the mirror all I see is blur you know so hang on are all those people right and I'm wrong or am I right and all those people are wrong you know just actually looking at little things like that can help us explore what if some aspect of this was true? What part of this could I take on as a new way of understanding myself in the world? Yeah. And so there's acceptance and exploration built into that for, for me, for my experience. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautifully said. It it's I love asking that question. And I'll tell you that every single guest I've had on has had a different answer, like a very different answer. And I ask it because I didn't realize this when I first named this podcast, but a lot of people actually find the term self-love quite triggering. Yeah. Right. And, and that was unintentional, but I think it's actually a good thing because it forces, it, you know, it, it's, it can be confronting, but that's also where the growth happens and the healing happens when you are confronted with an idea like that. And just the, you know, what you said about love being truly unconditional right? When you're angry at me, I still love you. When we're having an argument, I still love you. When you're doing this thing that I don't like, I still love you both to somebody else in the world and to yourself. Yeah. And that unconditional love, that's what love is. Love is not, I will love you when you lose five kilos or only when you're nice to me or only if you do things to make me happy. That's not love at all. No. At all. No. 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 And I think it's really easy to forget that it's a journey and there's a beginning and the end. And, and, you know, even five, 10, 15 years down the track, we might do something that we think that we're well beyond, but just like if someone's learning to cook, you might show them how to use the toaster and how to make a cup of tea. And then you might progress to scrambled eggs. And then the next time they're in the kitchen, you wouldn't expect them to make a roast dinner. And if two years into their cooking journey, they burnt their roast dinner, you would be, well, let's chalk that one up to learning, right? And I think we can be really hard on ourselves in our personal development journey, whatever name we give to the particular flavor of that for us and experience of that for us. We can be really hard on ourselves when we've burnt the toast, (laughs) right? I mean, maybe the toast was frozen that day or somebody else 
had cooked something else in the toaster and, you know, we were just caught in a mode where we didn't think to think differently. And so we got caught off guard or we weren't present that day because we were more tired or something else had come up and allowing this to be part of the journey yeah. is actually part of the process of, you know, loving ourselves no matter what. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How, like at this stage in your journey, what does your self-care look like in comparison to what it used to look like? How do you honor yourself, mm -hmm. care for yourself, love yourself now? What does that look like? Yeah, this is a great question. I don't know that I really ever self-cared. I mean, when we're talking about before, like the things that I did, the way that I can see in hindsight, you know, what was self-caring then still had elements of like self-punishment in them or more precisely, absolute survival. And like I used to run and I would take a break from uni and I'd go for a run and it was this thing that I did for myself and I felt fantastic after and I loved how I felt afterwards and it would reset my day. But did I do that really out of self-care? I mean, at the time, kind of, yeah. In hindsight, I can see that... I also had to do that. Like I had to run to feel okay about myself. There was something about it that was conditional and, and you know, I was, it, I was living to prove myself. And so even in those things that I did for self-care, which was not part of my vocabulary, that I didn't rest. I didn't know that was a concept. Rest was blobbing. <laughs> that was the term given to it. So, I mean, nobody wants to be a blob. So that's been a really big trajectory, even just knowing that I could rest mm. as a thing in self-care. And so my self-care now is, um, I actually think of self-care now in, in the place that I'm at as the things that I do when I have to do something because I'm in a moment where I've got to survive and I've got to move through. So it's like, you know, we've got a plant and we care for it by feeding it and water it. So that's what self-care is to me. And then when we shift that and we come, we become self-loving, we then we might talk to the plant. We make sure that it's in the right environment and getting, you know, it's in the right soil and it's got the right amount of light and it's on the right angle and things like that. So those things for me are like I go for a walk, I meditate, I eat slowly and mindfully, I connect with people, I choose to do things that feel good, which doesn't mean I shirk my responsibilities, but it means that I deliberately put things into my day that I really enjoy. And also managing stress is big for me. So sometimes cleaning the house is a self-loving action. Yep. <laughs> because, you know, not like having a house that feels like it's being looked after you know, it is part of that picture, having a bath, reading a book. Um, but also for me, self-love is not an action that I undertake anymore. It's a mental decision that I make that the moment that I'm in is for me. And so that can literally be the dishes, the groceries, the conversation with the, the cranky person, you know, because it's not about the thing. It's about my attitude and my presence. And when we're present and we're choosing it, anything can fill us. Anything can be our moment. And that to me is ultimately self-love. Like, can I love myself and fill myself up on the fly? Yeah. Could I have done that? 20 years ago no effing way <laughs> you know it's, it's like that's a long journey yeah yeah it is a long journey and it, it just it, it shows how far you've come right like it's it's that's just a really beautiful reflection of you know to give you some perspective I think yeah 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 okay so before we talk about your work which I really want to do because I find your work fascinating I just want to ask, you know, everything that you've just said about bringing things into your day, right? Like finding those moments throughout the day, eating mindfully, taking time, going for a walk. You have two children. 
And there are a lot, and this, I, I'm, I am not a mother, I don't have kids yet, but there are a lot of people who listen to this who are mothers who have some serious mom guilt, right? I can't take time for myself. I can't do this for myself. That's selfish. I'm taking away from my family, whatever that looks like. Did you have that? And how did you overcome that? <laughs> Yeah, my face says it all. <laughs> yeah, your face is yeah. your face is like uh huh. <laughs> and sometimes still, yeah, you know, sometimes still, where like I'm, I the child that's home is being home educated this year because of health stuff. Where you know we're navigating medical appointments every week. I have a business. I'm now studying a master's. I've also been working a day a week in a health food shop. And, you know, running a house, like life is actually uncomfortably full right now. And so the time that I spend with my family when life feels really full can feel like this push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. And I think it's, I don't, you know, we talk about you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can help other people. And that analogy doesn't cut it for me because that's something that like that's something that we hear with our mind. It's not something we understand in our body. And so what I think is really important to understand is when we've got guilt about doing things for ourselves, it's because our pro programming, our conditioning, what I like to call the good girl rules, if you identify as a, as a woman, those rules are telling you that you doing something for you breaks the rules and has a consequence. And so learning to gently, like there's an elastic band that you can lean into for support, you can gently still do something for you whilst holding yourself, even though there's guilt there, is really important because you have to reprogram that part of you that has learnt doing something for you has a payoff, is bad, you know, someone will be upset or cranky or it's selfish, right? So that's that's like the punitive parent voice, right? So how can we essentially say, I see that part of me that feels bad and I'm going to go do something for myself. So small sips of water things is how I think of it. Like if we chug our two litres of water at the end of the day, we're nowhere near as hydrated as if we've had that in lots of small sips throughout the day, right? So we can't save up our self-love and self-care for the day spa or the haircut that we have every eight weeks. We need to take these small moments. So like drink your tea or coffee out of the most beautiful mug and make that a ritual in itself. Step outside to eat. Like just look at the butterflies or the birds or the clouds with your children or paint something and, you know, put on dirty clothes, do it outside so you can make a mess and not worry about the house. Like there are all these little ways that you can integrate moments for you and self-care for you that uh, can like lean into that guilt and make space. But it's also about like feeling good. When you feel good, life feels good and you feel good about yourself. So even those little things that you do for yourself, they add up to something like really momentous. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that lean in, lean in. And I yeah, like you feel the support of the elastic yeah. band. Yeah, 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 I, I like like I like that I'm a visual person. So I'm like picturing a, like a big thick elastic band that you can lean into and that can support you. That's right. So like, you're not just out there sort of flailing around falling over, you're like leaning in, yes, this has got me. And then you stand back up and then you can do it again. And then you stand back up and it's, yeah you can slowly, slowly, right? Like, and that's how you, that's how you, you shift things. Okay. Beautiful. Emma, please tell us how this self-love journey has led you to entrepreneurship and what do you bring to the world right now? Yeah. Entrepreneurship also came to me through parenting and I didn't, I didn't want to work nine to five. I don't like working nine to five. I never want to work full time again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't having that regularity of rhythm and then not being able to access things. I just didn't enjoy. So I fell into having a business because I wanted some time flexibility and I wanted to be home with my children. And so that worked for me. And I started teaching yoga and, you know, that was able to kind of just fit in around the kids or with the kids and with my husband's work. And so that has been an evolving trajectory to what I now do as your pleasure coach, where 
I support people with pleasure in life and bed. And that is a whole lot of regulating the nervous system if we need to do that and then developing a mindset of pleasure and cultivating an unwavering dedication to self. So that's where, you know, you look at all the reasons why we've got guilt and why we say no to ourselves and learn to say yes without the guilt, learn to communicate our needs, all that sort of stuff. And a lot of people come to see me because of libido mismatch, for example, and um, the whole picture of what our life looks like informs our pleasure in life and in bed. Like there's so many people that I work with that don't know they can ask for what they want or, you know, where anorgasmia is really normal, which is where you've never had an orgasm or you don't have it with this partner. And particularly if we look at heterosexual interactions there is an orgasm gap and so it's you know learning how the environment that we've been in all, all our life leads to where we are now and then using pleasure as a tool to stabilize the nervous system build things into the into our life that feel like yes and a self-loving and a mindful and then you know allowing things to kind of evolve and shift and grow and, and keep picking off those little bits of conditioning from there yeah that's amazing that's amazing I feel like probably everybody needs this <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't think there's anybody anybody that I know who could not benefit from from this from this work from tuning in and being aware and you know tapping into pleasure more and tapping into self and mindfulness of body like everything that you've just said I feel like if everybody did that the world would be a very different place yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. and the more people do it too and the more mothers do it parents do it that's going to impact the next generation absolutely because we're yeah. teaching our children one that it's okay to feel something that is other than happy but also showing them what self-love and self-care looks like and showing them what humility looks like and also being able to have those difficult conversations with more ease. Yeah. And that's, I'm not just talking about the birds and the bees, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but just answering questions and being able to acknowledge, you know, that, that, that topic might be uncomfortable or, Hey, I don't know. Why don't we look that up together? Yeah. All yeah. of those things become easier. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, if there's somebody listening who is maybe where you used to be, is there one sort of self-loving practice or exercise that you would recommend they begin with? Yeah. Yeah, there is. I think of it as any one thing. And so the question is, when you wake up in the morning, hand on your heart, hand on your belly, and just take, take a slow, deep breath there, and ask yourself, if I could have any one thing today, what would it be? And just notice what the answer is that comes up. And if the answer is genuinely non-practical for that day, you know, what's a compromise or what would the next best thing you could do for yourself be? You know, if a, if a two-night holiday or, you know, a week in the Bahamas is what comes up and, you know, you just can't get on a plane right then, then it's still signaling that you'd like a break and how could you factor that in right and you can you does doesn't have to be first thing in the morning if you forget any moment you remember if I could have any one thing right now what would it be yeah that is that's a I love that that's simple but powerful yeah because how often does the average person stop and actually ask themselves what do I want what do I need right now in this moment that's not a thing that's very common no no and generally what I witness is that the answer is usually something very immediate, like I want the sun on my back or I'd like a glass of water or I want to phone a friend. You know, it's something really, really simple and everyday, but it just guides us towards more loving, more integrous actions that then help, you know, to keep the nervous system that little bit more soothed and also build that little bit of pleasure. It becomes a small sip of water, but a small sip of water that is deeply of deep integrity to self yes yes yeah. beautiful that's beautiful emma if listeners want to get in touch with you or find out more about the incredible work that you do where's the best place for them to do that 
I don't know. Everything's shifting. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a website, which is emma-mccann.com temporarily. If that doesn't work, it's, it'll be Emma Pleasure. <laughs> and um, on socials, I'm Emma McCann Coach. But again, I, that is shifting to Emma Pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will, I'll do my best to, I'll put the links in the show notes and as things change, I'll do my best to check back in and update. So hopefully the links in the show notes are accurate. I'll do my best. Yeah. (laughs) It's beautiful to be in that place of transition though. Challenging when you're asked that direct question, but really beautiful, like birthing this new presence, this new new way of, of being of showing up. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Emma, as we get ready to wrap up, um, I feel like I could ask you so many questions. I, I am so curious about the work that you do, um, but I'm just very conscious of time. As we get ready to wrap up, is there anything else that you feel called to share? Any last bits of wisdom, anything else in your heart and your body that wants to be brought out today? That's a good question. We've covered a lot. Yeah. I'm going to take a moment to just tune in. Mm-hmm. So what's coming through is that some of what I've talked about might not be believable. Mm. (laughs) Depending on where we are in our journey, you know, it can almost be off-putting to see and triggering to see someone who is further along their journey and can even at times pour salt in our wounds. And so it's really important to me that wherever we are in our journey, we feel validated and honored for being in that place that is like worthy. And we all are where we are shifting and moving things constantly. Life is a constant adjustment. So if there are thoughts of that vein, then just invite yourself to sit with acknowledgement of being in a place that is supporting you stepwise 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 just like on a walk we never finish the walk because we've taken one step we keep walking and eventually we get back to where we started or wherever we're ending yeah so life is kind of this ever evolving journey and we're never at the end and sometimes people look like they're further away or much further ahead they're also still working on their own stuff and everyone's got a story. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Okay. Well, let's leave it there for now. We may have to have a part two for this, <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's, let's leave it there for today. That's absolute perfection. Emma, thank you so much for coming on for candidly sharing your story with us and your incredible journey and the work that you do. Um, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor and a pleasure.